What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? I'm Salandia Hammond, a.k.a. Sue Ham, baby. Oh, this is so dope. Look at this. Dr. Salandia, put some respect on that name. I love this. <laughs> the seat at the table is a beautiful thing, you know, and it's all about how when you get at the seat at the table, you try to make impact. You, you, you bring about true transformation and impact when you're at the table. The invitations were set, the table set, and the trailblazers, whose stories we've introduced you to throughout the year, showed up to take their seat at our dinner table. They're educators, advocates, and members of the arts community. We gathered them together for a family-style dinner, much like the ones that take place in households all over the world. At the center, good food, good company, and good conversation. The only difference, our cameras were rolling. Join us over this next hour as we talk about the black experience relating to topics like community, crime, mentorship, and mental health. Our goal is to spark conversations and educate on why inclusion is necessary and why representation matters. This is a Seat at the Table Family Dinner. It's an open conversation. We're talking about education, we're talking about arts, we're talking about politics, we're talking about law enforcement and crime. And so we're just talking with people who intimately understand each area of that. We want this conversation to be open and to be light. We want it to be impactful because each one of you has lived a life that has made a difference. That's why you're you've got a seat at the table. Again, I cannot thank you enough for everything you all have been to this franchise and what it means moving forward. But I'm gonna have to my grandpa, you can just call me grandpa and get all you want, but want all you get. He makes you sit there and eat it. Pass the end. You went for what I'm going for. Watch your name. Yes. 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 Grandpa, and I have been fat so many dogs with my grandpa. I'm <laughs> 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 My first question um, for the table, and remember, anybody can jump in and answer. What has it been like to have had a seat at the table? What have you heard from the community now that they've seen your story? I have so many calls, all over, not just in South Carolina, people have saw it, otherwise on other platforms and so forth. So it's just been rich to get that kind of comment from individuals who saw the show. We've just been in enthused uh, about I'm being on. I, I guess everybody must have had a TV on that <laughs> For me, it's helped me advance my um, my goal of mentoring folks. When I first went to Clemson, there were, there were 12 people that looked like me. And our goal was, don't mess it up for the person behind you. So when folks saw my story, they knew 
that that, that was something I've always wanted to, wanted to do to to make a way for someone else and not mess it up for the folks behind me. So I started getting calls from folks who kind of kind of knew of me. You know, Dr. Lynn, can I get an introduction to such and such? And so it 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 made made my mentoring made my mentoring easier. I would say for me, um, as as a person who's been incarcerated for a total of 22 years. This gave those men and women inside of a prison system, letting them know that it's possible that you could walk out of prison and do exactly what you say, but it also changed the mindset of most people in society that when they see someone with a felony conviction, they only see you with the conviction and don't see the potential that you possess. And it means a lot to me to know that a man or a woman is sitting in prison feeling hopeless. And when that television show, The Seat at the Table, pops up and they heard that I was once in prison, they may have been thought, thinking about killing themselves or even giving up. Mm -hmm. And to see that is now give them the opportunity to dream and believe that it's possible. My experience was I used to have this old cliche that I would use, hey, cuz, what's your problem? And they said, how'd you come about with that? Cause, cliche, I just did it because it made people feel calm. It would, it would calm my bad situations when I went on call and they said, okay, so what happened to that today with our law enforcement? Because they seem to be altogether different. So with me, now I see people in the street and they go, here it comes. <laughs> and, and, and so it does bring about camaraderie and they just said, okay, so where are the police today like you? Hey, cuz, I just noticed you got the, my, me and you got the same last name, so what's yeah. up, cuz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think for me, um, not everyone looks exactly like me that was calling that said, hey, I saw that story, can you tell me more? Um, so it really, really started to open uh, doors uh, in terms of conversation uh, that could have been closed before. It opened up a lot of doors for people to say, hey, I can do that too, and I should get my health screenings as well. So um, I thank you for that yeah. because um, you have really helped me in my journey with trying to get the message out to people. And it was evident because of the phone calls and uh, Facebook messages and Instagram and whatnot. So thank you. For me as a black woman, um, who's from a rural space, but also as a, a founder and executive director of a nonprofit, I've had to build my own tables. Um, everything, I, I've always had to build it myself because there wasn't a welcoming seat or space for me. So being able to be invited to be a part of um, this type of, of opportunity and series was really, um, it was inspiring to myself, it was affirming. Um, for myself um, and, and also to those that look like me to know that as black women that our voices don't have to be silenced and they won't be silenced and so I think it just reaffirmed um, that as well. And I can say for myself, art was a light for me and seeing that it was a light for other young people, old people alike who have gone through things, choosing to create the freedom within yourself. You have to do that because you create the life that you want. Nobody can take that from you. And creativity is the number one thing that no one can touch. And you create the world that you want to see. And the world that I've created for myself has opened the doors for so many young people to watch and see that they can do the exact same thing, if not better than me. Do you feel like you had to work harder to be where you are? Yes. 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 Without a doubt. Well, I, I'm just going to be real with you. It's harder for me being a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, I have to work harder, prove myself, and I'm like, it's not fair, I don't complain, I don't whine, I just find a way. And typically when you're a trailblazer, it's very, very hard. But what are we to do? That's our gifting, that's our life. And so it's good to just be at the table with other people who understand what I'm going through and who can assist me in my journey and I can assist you right. in your journey. I don't think a person at this table had it easy because because mm -hmm. the success doesn't come from being comfortable. Right. 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 Success comes from your mistakes. 
Learn that you learn. Yeah. If you don't learn right. anything, you're never going to appreciate and be able to move forward. You learn in your mistakes. And that's the failure is actually the success. Yeah. And I was so, afraid of failure. Yeah. I was afraid of failure. But with everything I tackled, I, I was afraid of failure. Why is it necessary to share these stories? Why is it necessary to celebrate our voices? It takes nothing from my candle to light somebody else's oh, candle. Okay. Absolutely. And I've never given away anything freely that I missed. Right. If I give it away freely, I, and particularly with employment, I, I have about 100 employees, and, and I and I always tell them, they get paid for what I do. So, you know, if they do good, I do good. Right. If, I, right. if I do good, they do good. Right. When they find out that none of us had it easy, None of us born on third base. <laughs> we try, We were trying to come to bat. Right. And some of them born on third base hasn't scored yet. Exactly. I haven't. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm the second oldest person at this table. He's the oldest. <laughs> so, we have made a lot of progress in South Carolina in the last 50 years or so. We need to preserve that for posterity. Yes. So in my down the hill years, my 83 years, I have taken it upon myself to try to preserve our gains, our failures, our progress. If you, we don't do it, somebody else is going to come along later on and have to. And I can tell the restore. I, I worked in a man's world, and it was not easy. Uh, being, um, I guess, one of five females working with about a thousand men, uh, it was not easy. Uh, you were told that you weren't going to succeed. And you know, they said that the scale of justice is supposed to be equal. Don't believe that because it, it, it moves every day, it goes up and down. And if you're not willing to try to be strong enough to balance your scale, then you're not gonna succeed. I was blessed um, in these last, what, a couple weeks ago to go to Ghana for, the, for my first international trip to Ghana and to be able to see the African culture in, in real time, not in a book, but in real time. And I had an opportunity to see community completely different than the community we see here. You know, we hear this term said it takes a village to raise a child, right? We hear that a lot of times in our community, but to really physically see, because it's an African proverb, but to physically see how it actually looks I was staying, we, we stayed in Cape Coast and I saw this family, it was maybe about five, 600 people live in this particular village by the Atlantic Ocean. This is where they eat every day from. And the elders of the community, what their role was is to go out every morning at five o'clock and go fishing. Every morning for the village. And then when, as the boat get closer, the sun rises, the young men, 30, 40 of them begin to walk to the shore because their role was to swim out, get the rope, and begin pulling the ship, pulling the uh, canoe back to shore while the elders now rest. Then the women, an hour later, you saw the women just, just started walking towards the river, walking to the shore with the, with the big baskets on their head. Because now what their role was is to gather the catch for the day, put it in a pile, and begin to share it with the community. You know, so I went over it and I literally watched this for hours play out. And I talked to these brothers and sisters and the thing that they say is that this, our meal comes from the ocean every day. Each person knows their role. And I was like, this is what we're missing in our communities. And it comes from a lack of knowledge of who we are as a community, lack of our history and the connections that we have. We come from a place where we feel like it's us against you. But it's really not. We are all in this thing together. But we have lost that sense of family and value 
And that's one of the things that I took away from that is like we need in our communities, when we're sitting at these tables, we gotta be thinking about how do we restore our family? How do we restore our community? Not by policing. I didn't see one police in Cape Coast. I didn't see nothing. I didn't see anything but us governing ourselves. And, and lastly, I left there feeling like I was sick. I left, I left Ghana feeling and realizing how sick I was as a black man in America. Why? Because I saw when I saw my own people and I felt threatened by my own people. I felt like I wanted to fight when people would walk up to me. When I would see people with money, it was an elderly lady walking into a, into a phone store. She had a bag full of money. Like you said, a bag full of money. She had a bag full of money. My mind is like, why is this lady walking out of this store with all this money? In America, a young person would see that, what they'll think? Snack. Yo, I'm gonna take this old lady money. <clears throat> but everyone who's from Ghana, they saw that woman and never thought about robbing her, stealing her. But the sickness that we have in these urban communities, we would see that as a, as a, as a, as a thing that we should do. And that shows that we are sick in our mind, our thought process, and we need to change that as a collective community that we see each other as family. They saw that elderly woman as a family. She's royalty. They would never ever think about harming this lady. But in our community, we see an elder, community, an elder woman or elder man with money, we would rob her. That's sick. I think for me why it's so important, because I've always known at an early age that I wanted to be in entertainment, stage plays, acting, whatever watching the Young and the Restless, uh, you know, I was like, I can do that, I want to do that as the world turns to guiding light. You know, I watched the CBS stories growing up. <laughs> Reality started to sink in as I got older. I'm like, I am living in a rural area. I don't have the money to go to a Juilliard. I probably don't even have the talent. I don't even know anybody around here who's doing what I want to do. I can't even go to somebody and sit at their feet, you know? And so I joined the Marine Corps. And then lo and behold, there comes, yes, sir. <laughs> there comes a Tyler Perry who is showing us in the arts world, you can write, you can direct, you can produce your own shows. And I'm like, my goodness, if he can do it, and I didn't even come from the tumultuous livelihood he came from, then I know that I can do it. And so for me, this is important because I saw him from afar. But I was like, what if I could go back home, as Dr. Rivers and I have been talking, go back home and I can impact those lives of the people back home and they can see, touch me, you know, feel me, then they'll know, hey, you can do this too. So this is why it's so important for me because I want to get to the mindset. Mindset controls everything. And if they can change their mindset, you change your mind, you change your world. If you can change your mind and you can actually see, because some people can't see with the third eye just yet. They need to see with these two first. So if they can see somebody with these two eyes first that are doing the thing in their backyard, then their imagination begins to take off and they can do anything that they can dream of. So that's why this is important for me, why it's, it's important for people to see, touch, feel, talk to people who have done it because some people who don't have that hope, some people who don't have the ability to travel outside of their county, outside of their town, right? right? right. They need to see somebody who's right there in their backyard doing it so that they can have that inspiration to do it. And that's why this is so important to me. And I can say one thing, my family comes from Paxville, so one thing my grandfather always said is never look at one person bigger than you because they can do something that you can't. The farmer can't do it with a doctor can do, but a doctor can't farm like that farm. Right. So there's nobody that is above you. Right. And me being able to grow as much as I was as an artist, it's so easy for people to leave where they came from. Mm -hmm. But for me to come back, I just want to show people that what you have is unique. No one's seen that before. Our city, even if it doesn't seem like we don't have the resources, your story matters. Man. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. And if everybody was the same, this world would be boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, my favorite, my, favorite my, my mission statement is painting positive vibes on the canvas of life. You are your own canvas. You paint the colors with what you've been presented. Even if you don't think it's nothing, to somebody else, that could be the world. As a community, we have the responsibility to know that we can do anything if we set our minds to it. And as a community, even for me as a little girl, I didn't have nobody. 
and I wish I did. Mm -hmm. So now I am the person that I can look up to with my inner child to say, dang, Aja, I always thought I would be here. And now I can be that for somebody else's little girl. That's, That's yeah. why I came home, because yeah. home is where I belong. And home is within me, but mm -hmm. my community helped me get there. Even when I was working on the Black Wall Street mural, being up 800 feet in the sky, doing a mural by myself in under three weeks, I had little kids with their sketchbooks saying, I should look, you're a superhero. And I would drop down my scaffold and be like, nah, you are better than me at your age. And they take that with me. You never know yeah. how one conversation can change your life. Absolutely. I'm thankful for that. Have e any of you ever had a moment when you felt like I just didn't do enough? Mm, yes. Even sitting at this table, knowing all that you've accomplished, yes. what was that I didn't do enough moment like? Only 21% of my guys had of two parents mm. in the home. Wow. Now let me say this, some of the single parent guys did better than the two parents. So I mean, you, you can't categorize them, but but most of them were needed a fatherly figure. And I, I, I've been a father to so many, and I do feel when something happens to one, I feel that I've fallen short. And some of, most of them were from single, just mama, and uh, they were able to, I, I was their father for four years. Some of them for six. <laughs> but I, and, I, and every time one fails, I, I feel I take the blame for it. But right there to try and help out again. My father transitioned. My mother transitioned when I was 16. My grandmother. It's so many elders in my family that I never took advantage of learning, literally learning who I am, my family tree. So it's going to be a lot of gaps in between. We're going to have to transition, okay? We're going to start, we're going to just like a thousand questions in a minute, all right? So we're going to throw out topics and then y'all jump in and answer it. Politics. Whoa. <laughs> you, you got one. We <laughs> got one here. <laughs> we're going to volunteer. We're going to volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have a seat at the table, yeah. politically. Yeah. And I got elected right. to the legislature. There were no blacks. I mean, there were no whites. We were the first three blacks to get elected. And we were treated like furniture. Mm -hmm. All the white legislators mm -hmm. went the other way. But when they realized that our vote equaled their vote, you find one of them coming up beside you. Hi, Jim, can you co-sponsor this bill here with me? Mm -hmm. You know then that you are having input into what's going on. So you got to be at the table everywhere, whether it's the yes. school board table, whether it's the legislature, whether it's the Congress, you got to have a seat at the table. Otherwise, you become the menu. Yes. How about this? I'll throw this word out. Education. Paramount. Yeah. Paramount. Absolutely. Yeah. I, think, I think education is key. And we have to make sure that we are encouraging our young people to keep going. Yeah. Regardless of what mistakes they make, we cannot throw people away. Mm -hmm. I say that all the time at Piedmont Technical College, where I have the honor of serving as president. We cannot throw people away. Yeah. Just because you made a mistake does not mean that's the end. Quite honestly, <laughs> without education, folks are not going to get as far as they need to go in this world. You know, the, the gone are the days really where you can uh, be extremely successful without having some type of formal training. And so for me, I would say education, education, education. Don't stop. Don't stop. Um, and, and my last point would be that is why this seat at the table is important for me. Because I want young boys and girls to look at me and think, Good grief, if she can do it. In some families, you might be the first generation of that. First generation. So you have to step yeah. out on the boat the first time yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. That's all right. There are colleges, there are college presidents like me that want to show you where to go. Oftentimes we feel left behind because we don't know if they knew Darcy, they would do it. 
but they yeah. don't know. Mm -hmm. So we have to guide them in the direction that they need to go. Yeah, and I, I was one of 12, the first to graduate from high school, the first to graduate from college, but somebody had to break the chain. And I said, well, now if I break this chain, man, everybody's gonna get education. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Of the 12, and I was one of the youngest, and now all, just about every one of my, and I have a huge family. <laughs> They're going to college and, and, and they're just opening up their own businesses and everything, but the chain had to be broken. Yeah. And education is like climbing a mountain. At the, at the foot of the mountain, you can only see so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as you ascend the mountain, you can see farther. And once you get to the top, you can see for miles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what an education does. Uh, you understand more of your surroundings, mm -hmm. and um, it—it's it, just—it's it, just very important. And like like was just said, uh, don't tech schools. I tell all our high school guys, technical school, junior college, a, a four-year school, a plumber. Cost yes. four hundred dollars yes. just to say hello. Yes. <laughs> I was just about to go there. A brick layer, a brick layer. They still doing good. Yes, sir. Uh, a barber, uh, electrician, and and it's very important. Uh, your community colleges, and then some of them have enough credits. You might want to go into a four year school. But in education. It's very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to echo that because education to me, from my eyesight, it looks a little different. Not necessarily going to uh, get a PhD or a master's anymore because I do real estate investing. Mm -hmm. And like you said, just to say hello to a plumber is $400. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> he ain't crawl under your house yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, and I, I believe the more education you have, the higher you go. The more you know, the higher you go. Absolutely. And so, but apply that education. Absolutely. I mean, we're all lifelong students, but apply the education that you do get. Oh, yes. right. and, and we have to be careful not to, to leave people out. We talked about yes. that earlier. We can't leave pockets and segments of folks out. Right. Because we talk about building communities. We have to build the whole community. Mm -hmm. And if you leave segments and pockets of folks out, you're not going to build the entire community. Right. So that's really that's important. True. And it's important to me to make sure that everyone feels like they have a place. Kind of funny, I, I tutored a guy I tutored a player and he made an F and had nerve enough to tell the professor, I don't deserve this F. The teacher said, I know you don't, but that's the lowest I can get you. <laughs> <laughs> he must have made a Q. <laughs>your heart just like it breaks mine the violence among young people mm. where do you think we're at what do you think we need to do when it comes to this so i think that we have to reimagine how how we how we police people mm. and how we begin to address this trauma is something that we don't have a lot of conversation about mm -hmm. poverty forces people into an invisible world yeah. when you raise in poverty you're no longer being seen and you do anything in that state to be seen. And unfortunately, guns and all of the crime, all of the things that lead to criminal activity is readily available in your community. So we can have as many police in these communities, but we have to begin to help individuals in these communities heal from their own trauma. And we have to have more counseling in these communities and find ways to be able to put more programs in the community, not just saying, buy the guns back, that does not change it in my humble opinion. It changes when we start helping these young people see the value of education, connecting them with the elders, begin to help them process trauma that comes from poverty. Mother verbally abused them, father neglect them. They have been physically, sexually assaulted. When you live in that world, you do everything to let nobody come into that world because I want to stay here and it's safe. I agree with you, Lester. We uh, just did an anti-bullying rally 
And so we connect with the kids through the music because we know the kids into the music and do skits, the arts. Because when you can see how you're being projected, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so I told the kids, I said, you know, you may think it's okay to be picking at somebody or whatever, but there was a nine-year-old, there was a, a note on his desk that said, uh, kill yourself. And the kids in the audience were like, <gasps> But when you were talking just now, it took us going into that school and sharing those stories with those kids. You're right, you can put as many police officers on the streets as you want, but if you're not dealing with the trauma, and there's PTSD in these communities. We you know, we're, and I'm a veteran. We always talk about PTSD from veterans, but it's in these communities with the high crime rates and the high poverty rates, and we don't deal with that. And until we deal with that, and until we go back into our schools and go back into our communities and communicate with our children and provide them that counseling, not a whole lot is going to change because again, I am of the firm belief that everything goes back to mindset. We can, we can go a long ways in our communities helping, but let the young people know that Beyonce and Michael Jordan and those, that, those are not your idols. Those are not your mentor. Your pastor, your dad, your coach, those are your mentors, people that you see. He's not, you're not going to see the first. You, you might idolize them, whatever, but people that you know, your barber, the people that work in the communities, we, we can make a stab at it. We're not going to let it go. These kids, they'll, they'll listen. You have some that are hard-headed, but they, they, they have the wrong... Um, they idolize the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a it's a yeah. matter of wanting to, you talked about, um, you know, wanting to be seen. That's yeah. why mm -hmm. education spaces, uh, not only kids, you know, I have adults there too. You have to see them. You gotta see people. Um, because when you when you feel seen, when you feel wanted, when you feel a part of the space, it makes a whole difference in terms of how you move in that space. Because you know that Dr. Rivers wants you there. Mm -hmm. I have some kids that walk around, and I, I know they have a little chip on the shoulder. Like you know, she knows who I am. She knows my name. Um, and and that, but that matters. It's it's, a, it's about being seen. As a young lawyer, after I left the state house, I was appointed assistant solicitor in South Carolina, first black assistant solicitor. And the black community said, why are you accepting this position? You're going to have to put your people in jail. Well, I found out immediately that the solicitor's position, the prosecutor, is the most important person in the criminal justice system. Because they make the decision of whether to try you or not to try you, or whether to put your case in the draw and forget about it. And I did a lot of that and helped a lot of young men and counseled a lot of them because I was there and I could mm -hmm. cut off that track for men going in further. We don't have enough of that today. We need enough solicitors, whether it's by color or other, but those who are more concerned about our young men than others. Yeah. You know, a lot of us say, old oh, community policing don't work. It did. It was very strong because the police that was assigned to a community had to work that community. I had 26 programs in the city of Columbia, and a lot of young people's lives were changed because of the many programs that we had in the city of Columbia. The thing that's happening now is you have so many young parents teaching their children to hate law enforcement which is not good. Um, they, they shouldn't tell their children to hate law enforcement or to run when you see them coming. My thing is, if children are into trouble, you tell a young man, come fly, don't die. Because they run and they think everything is all right, 
But number one, you can't outrun the police. Eventually, you're going to get caught. Uh, so you comply and don't die. Let the judge and the uh, solicitor or whomever make decisions about how you're going to fare in life. I think we have to reimagine our communities. I think that we have to reimagine the way we do community, the way that we live with one another, because all these all these things are important and, and all the work that we've done is important, but we have to acknowledge that there has been a disconnect and that disconnect is something that we didn't choose to create. We, we came into a system that intentionally disconnected us okay. and so in order for us to be able to preserve our stories in order for us to be able to educate or inspire that other person we have to recreate the way in which we have been living and doing community with one another uh, we have to we we understand and we recognize that police officers are important but we can't move forward if we don't acknowledge the history of our community with law enforcement because all those things are still real. Trauma is real, right? So it's like in order for us to to reimagine, in order for us to move forward as a community, I believe that we have to acknowledge the good, the bad, what makes us uncomfortable, right? And what brings us joy at the same time. Because unless we're truly willing to do that, I don't believe that as a people um, and as a community, we can move forward um, in, in the way and, and retell our stories in a way that um, continues to inspire, to continue to, that builds hope and that reshapes um, our history a, as a people. Um, so I just think that, I just wanted to offer that. Um. Absolutely, what you're saying is so right because it touches on everything. We have yeah. to think about where we were and mm -hmm. where we are right now and work together to find that solution, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, so the final topic that we're gonna talk about, something I'm very passionate about, mental health. Yes. A lot of times in our community, yes. <laughs> it is put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it, let's dive in. The work that I do um, while I work with survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence um, in Stockton in South Carolina, um, it really goes back to you know what Lester was saying and I um, believe what she was saying down here at the end in regards to the trauma, but also, you know, we talk about PTSD and my husband is, is um, still serving 18 years in the army. And, but we also have to think about post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I, I don't know how many people may be aware of that, but understand that like we were innately born with trauma in us. And so I, I think that we are finally getting to a place um, where we are, because we are seeing more prominent people, um, to begin to speak out, you know, and say, I think about people like Taraji P. Henson. Um, I think about Charlemagne, the guy who talk about mental health, right? It's now opening doors for your common everyday person to realize it's okay for me to say I need help. Mm -hmm. It's okay for me to um, open up to someone and to be able to trust them. But I do think at that same token, it's like, it, it's, it's an absolute need for it. We have had women that have been abused and never told anyone, and they're 60 and 70 years old. You understand? And so these are things that people have been caring for them because they were never taught that it was okay for them to talk about it. And so um, we, I think we just have to continue to be even more intentional, um, but also understanding that it's necessary for us as a people, because like you said, it's mindset um, in yes. order for us to I think it has to make it accessible too. Yes, like, absolutely. It, it has to be accessible. When we make it accessible, I think that now we begin to help people heal from right. these various levels of trauma in a holistic way that connects with who we are okay. as people. One of, one of the things that we do at Piedmont Tech is we do have free counseling because adverse childhood experiences, that's real. Yeah. And so those students, they bring that to work. Yeah. But what we found is also my workers, my staff, my faculty, they bring their experiences mm -hmm. to work as well. Oh, I bring my experiences. Mm -hmm. So we have free counseling for them. Mm -hmm. um, they are able to go to a counselor and, um, and it, I, none of that is ever reported back to me. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that they do individual and we get zero reports on that. 
ironically, we did it mostly for our students, thinking that that would be a great thing. And we find that we have better numbers with faculty and staff needing the help. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I would, um, I would like to say they say it jokingly that neurotics build castles in the sky and psychotics move into them. <laughs> so, uh, so you. Uh, <laughs> Both of them need help, but uh, but when uh, when Congressman Cliven does his Kanzada, and I'm and we have one in the upstate too, Dr. Lynn, um, when they they are doing physical, doing things like testing for diabetes, whatever, whatever they always have someone there. Uh, with numbers for the mental health part. We just have to keep encouraging people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to Because we most of us, we are not the experts, That's but right. we certainly can. Uh, Dr. Lynn used the word a while ago, influence. Mm -hmm. You can be the most handsome fella or the most beautiful lady, but if you don't have influence. That's right. And we can influence. This, this seat at the table, look, it's going to help us influence. It really is. Absolutely. This seat at the table, look, it's going to help us influence. It really is. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody remembers Bull Street and its facilities. Yeah. They all closed yeah. down. It's new. Yeah. There's nothing there. And one of my pet peeves was a sick man, a mental man, don't need to go to jail. He needs help. But well, where are we going to send them? They still put them in jail. Once they're in jail for a little while, then they're back on the streets. Nowhere to go. Most families are afraid of their mental family members, but there's nowhere for them to go. And I say every day, our government need to find some facilities to put those people that really need help and attention, and they don't have anywhere to go. So you find them on the streets all over this state and all over the United States because nobody is doing anything for free. If we're not we're not we're not willing to disrupt and disrupt the table and create another table, then we're gonna always see this. Like mm -hmm. you said, mental health clinics now have been closed down closed for 10, down. 15 years and prisons have now become the new mental health mm -hmm. centers mm -hmm. where prison staff is not even trained to deal with mental exactly. health. Exactly. They're placed in a 24, in a cell for 24 hours to sit there and only they become more debilitated yeah. and even worse in their mental health mm -hmm. crisis, right? Because staff is not trained for this. So what we have to understand is political education is important, knowing who we elect, knowing the power of our vote, knowing the power of the governor, knowing the power of your solicitor, knowing the power of all of these people so that we can begin to make sure that we find out what their agenda is and do they have this on the agenda? If they don't, then we need to get it on the agenda. And then we support that person who chooses to run for this particular cause. If not, then we will still have these That's issues. Right. We still find these things in our community where we have to seat at the table, but communities are suffering. We have to understand our power of sitting at a table is that it's okay to disrupt the table. Shake the table just a little bit, shake a little bit. <laughs> And when you leave the table, it's good to look for somebody who looks like you to replace you. Yeah. yeah. It's okay not to be okay. There's never any shame in getting help. Yeah. Right. What role is your faith played? If, if you're a believer, or whatever, and and you're the eight, not you, the older the older you get, <laughs> the more the more you see proof that your faith has paved the way. Absolutely. And and you've seen the Lord make a way in things. And, and if you connect your faith to facts, you know that, and, and you know that your that faith is, is, is has paved the way for you. Not only paved the way, it's kept you strong. Yes. And you knew where it was coming from. 
I can't think of the times things have happened to me, and 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 I and I and I say it all the time. I, I beat. Look at God. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This this That's is this is no con coincidence. Well, I would ask this question to Coach Jeffries as the senior member of this table. If you had one piece of advice <laughs> by just 24 months, right? If you, if you had one piece of advice you would give the youngest person who is sitting at the same table with you, with I. Second youngest, second youngest. Second youngest. So if you, had, if you had one piece of advice, you'd give Aja. To the youngest. To the youngest. Yeah. The oldest to the youngest, and then I'm gonna give the youngest yeah. to the oldest. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I would think in life, uh, first of all, you have faith, but be happy at what you're doing. I, uh, all of my, and, and hate to make myself part of it, but it's my experience that I'm trying to get. What you're doing now, the job you have now is the best job you ever had, and treat it that way. But people notice you when you don't think they are. You say, oh, I'm doing my paintings, I'm doing all of it, but no one knows. Yes, they are. You see that at the table, they know they, they were noticing you. And what would you say, Aja, to Coach Jeffrey? The greatest treasure you'll experience in life is the journey, not the destination. Because once you get there, it's time to keep moving. Mm -hmm. My grandfather always told me, and I carry this with me, is never feel your death. Because if you're living, when you die, it's just the end of your road for somebody else to keep continuing. I am at this table right now because I never let fear take advantage of any situation. No matter what anybody tells me, what their experiences don't match my new experiences. Mm -hmm. So. Never fear anything. Mm -hmm. Let's give everybody a round of applause. <laughs> and as you all can see, you've been served with your champagne glasses. Every good dinner ends with a toast. This, don't drink it. Just put it up to your lips. <laughs> uh, I toast to many more open seats at tables just like this. I want to toast to servant leadership. difference. You have changed lives, are continuing to change lives, and it has been our great honor to sit down and tell your stories. And so as we raise our glass, here's to raising up the next generation of people who are creating a seat at the table. Come on, <laughs> As we hear on any good Sunday, the Lord bless you. Lord, keep you. May <laughs> shine upon you and bring you peace. <laughs> and do the Lord's work in your community. Amen. Right. Exceedingly abundantly. Uh, to be the glory. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>